Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session, LCMS Solutions for New Generation Therapeutics. I'm Susie Valdez of Labroots, and I will be your moderator for today's presentation. Now, I'd like to invite everyone to participate by submitting your questions during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, simply click on the question box on the left toolbar for further help or submit your concerns in the Ask a Question box. Today's session will be presented by Professor Jonathan Bones, Principal Investigator at the NIBRT for his research focusing on the development and application of liquid phase separations and mass spectrometry, LCMS and CEMS for the characterization of complex biopharmaceuticals. For complete biography of Professor Jonathan Bones, please click on the biography button within the presenter box information. Jonathan, welcome, sir. You may now begin your presentation. Hi, everybody, and thanks for tuning in. It's a pleasure to be here today to tell you about some of the work we've been doing at NIGERT, where we've been developing some LCMS solutions for our new generation therapeutics. For those of you not familiar with us, NIGERT is the National Institute for Bioprocessing Research and Training, and we're a world-class facility funded by the Irish government based on the University College Dublin campus in Dublin and Ireland. What we have at NIGERT is a scaled-down GMP-like facility which allows us to do a couple of different things. One of the main things which we do is offer competency-based training in an environment that replicates modern industrial bioprocessing facilities. And really what we mean by this is that NIBRT is a safe space. It's there to allow people to come to the facility and hopefully again soon when travel permits, but to come into the building and to learn by doing. So effectively they get to use real instrumentation, do real unit operations, make any mistakes that might happen, but because this isn't on the critical path, they will effectively learn by doing and ultimately return to their own facility in a workplace ready manner. The other thing which we do at NIBRT is research with impact. And we like to work very closely and collaboratively with people such as yourselves in the biopharmaceutical industry who are making these life-changing molecules. So for example, if you run into any binds and you need any assistance, we're always there to help to develop solutions and ultimately, hopefully, to get products on the market quicker and to the people who need them. Over the past number of years, we've been really proud to collaborate with the folks at Thermal Fisher Scientific. And together as part of this collaboration, it's allowed us to demonstrate the power of their world-leading instrumentation, software and consumables for all aspects of biopharmaceutical characterization, including some of what I'm actually gonna to talk to you about today. I don't think it needs to be told, but the past year has been a crazy one for everybody, and indeed for us all here in Biopharma also. We all know COVID-19 has caused huge disruption, but also has been a huge driver for innovation within the biopharmaceutical industry in the past year. We've seen massive changes in how we've worked, where we've had to implement things like social distancing, or even been locked out of our facilities or labs for quite some time in response to government-induced lockdowns to try and curb the spread of the virus. So it has been massively disruptive. But the one thing which is impressive when we look back over this time is really the speed at which science itself has reacted. And indeed, focusing on the positive, we've seen new therapies, including things like multiple vaccines and multiple antibody therapies, approved and deployed for the treatment of COVID-19 really at lightning fast speed. So again, this ability for science to react, to apply the technologies which we use day in, day out now, to do something for the benefit of, of humanity has really been impressive over the past while. And although COVID-19 has grabbed all the headlines, there were still 53 novel therapeutics approved by the FTA in 2020. So it's worth not forgetting them. And these included 12 new monoclonal antibodies, two antibody drug conjugates, two antibody cocktail treatments, not the ones which we probably heard about for the treatment of COVID-19. In fact, these were treatments for Ebola virus. And also we've had two oligonucleotide treatments. The good news for us as analytical scientists is the speed at which the industry is diversifying creates a huge significant challenge. But 
despite the complexity of these new molecular entities, the availability of cutting edge characterization technologies is really key to maintain the progress and to translate this into successful outcomes, and ultimately to get these molecules and these medicines to the patients who need them. The need for high performing analytical solutions encompassing things like liquid phase separations and high resolution mass spectrometry, and let's not forget supporting bioinformatics to make sense of all this data, has never been higher. So all in all, despite the disturbances over the past year, it really has probably never been a more exciting time for science. So what I'd like to present to you today are four short stories in biopharmaceutical characterization, which are really some activities which my group has undertaken over the past year. And these include the coupling of protein A affinity chromatography to high resolution orbit trap mass spectrometry for the determination of both titer and quality attributes of MABs and FC containing proteins. We are also going to talk to you about some work we've done comparing the performance of the thermoscientific orbit trap explorers to 40 MS and our beloved Cubes Active Plus, where we've had the pleasure to kind of compare both these systems head to head for native LCMS performance. We'll also talk to you about some rapid subunit analysis using online electrochemical reduction with high resolution LCMS for very rapid and very simple analysis on the subunit level for the characterization of MAPs. And then finally, we'll talk to you about peptide mapping of AAV based gene therapy using automated digestion and high resolution LCMS. So let's start with the first one, where we've investigated the coupling of protein A affinity chromatography to high resolution Orbitrap MS for rapid assessment of both Tyler and the product quality attributes. And this is work which has been performed by Craig Jakes and the group. So, protein A affinity chromatography is a key step for the purification of MABs and FC fusion proteins. And this is nothing new, this is widely known. It's really the first bulk purification step in a lot of the genetic processing of these molecules. The reason being as known again is that we can get very high capture affinity for these molecules based on the interaction of the FC and protein A to allow for their bulk purification and to allow for the removal of mass of a lot of the background contamination present. We've also routinely used the thermoscientific MAD pack protein A column for antibody analysis and purification on the small scale for, again, rapid titer determination using standard LCUV. There has been one previous report in the literature where people have looked to couple protein A directly to mass spec. But in this paper, a really nice report from Amgen, what they looked at was the coupling of the system, but using a solvent makeup flow to allow for denatured intact mass analysis. So even though the data was quite nice, we wanted to look at simplification of the system and ultimately utilization with native mass spectrometry. And we did this. And we wanted to, as I say, explore this, see what it could actually do and to use this if we could as a rapid method for both titer determination and also the assessment of the PQAs or the product quality attributes as quick as we could, because ultimately our goal with this is to deploy it in near real time for online process monitoring. And you can see an example chromatogram on the inset on slide here, whereby we could implement a five minute method where we could take our samples from our process, be it drug substance, be it drug product, inject them onto the map pack protein A, divert the initial flow through components out to waste so we didn't have any issues in terms of source contamination, and then do our frontal elution off the column into the mass spectrometer and get some very nice and impressive data So I'm going to talk to you about now. So to show you what this looked like, as mentioned, this was performed using the MAPPAC protein A column on a thermoscientific Vanquish Flex UHPLC coupled to our thermoscientific QXACTIF UHMR hyperquadrupol orbitrap mass spectrometer. And the data which you see on screen at the moment was data which was generated using Bevacizumab as a model antibody. So using the method outlined in the previous slide, wherein we could do our loading, our rapid frontal elution, and use that two minute divert valve to get rid of all those additional components at the start, the unretained material left that go out to waste. We get this very nice sharp chromatographic peak we can then look and see what the mass spectrum looks like. And indeed it is that classical charge reduced native looking spectrum, which is nice. This is what we wanted to achieve because ultimately due to the increased spatial spectral resolution present, we can perform very high efficient deconvolution 
And you can see this then on the right hand part where you get to see what the deconvoluted mass data looks like, which is indeed very, very nice. We're getting a lot of information in this case with regard to the causation present and its associated pairing. So one of the things when we thought about this, and when you think about protein A methods, is you have loading of the sample under standard physiological conditions, generally pH 7, 7.4. And we then do that front dilution by dropping the pH down quite fast. So our question was, why are we getting native-like mass spectra at pH 2.5, which in this case was the dilution condition performed? So to investigate this further, we actually did a pH titration using size exclusion chromatography coupled to native mass spectrometry, again, on our QEXACT of UHMR instrument. So Craig, in this case, took the antibody, he took soluble protein A and mixed them together and performed the analysis using mobile phases and buffers under various conditions of pH, as indicated on the right-hand portion of the chromatograms so that you can see on the left-hand panel of the slide. The nice thing with this as well is that even though protein A chromatography is really what we would say a bread and butter technique, something which everybody uses, there really hasn't been a huge amount in the literature which describes the actual stoichiometry of the complex formed. There's some studies, and we have to go back quite a long time to find these, performed using a variety of methods, but there is some consistency, some of which say the complex is one to one in terms of the protein A antibody, and some of which say it's two to one, two uh, antibodies to one protein A molecule. But when we perform the analysis here, and you can see as indicated with the purple triangles, the complex formed, we only ever saw it at a one-to-one -one stoichiometry. The nice thing with the data, when we go through this and actually look at the pH dependency, we can see the complex is rapidly formed and present really above pH five. As we lower the pH, we then start to see not the complex forming and only the protein A and the antibody present. And indeed, interestingly, as we went down to lower pH in this case, we also saw a slight distortion of the charge envelope from that classical charge reduced native looking charge envelope to some ions appearing at lower M over Z values, potentially indicating that there might be some sort of reversible change in the structure happening to allow for increased charge to be uptaken and the spectrum to become distorted. So this was interesting. It gave us an indication as to this pH behavior of the actual um, the system. But the nice thing again with this, when we did our protein A directly coupled to mass spectrometry, we didn't see this effect. And we assume that, that this is actually kinetic in terms of the elution from the column and transfer into the instrument is so fast compared to the SEC experiments where the residence time in the column is much longer. So we don't see these effects and therefore we have no issues in terms of this distortion of the spectrum and its usability for deconvolution afterwards. What we also wanted to do then was to evaluate the performance of the method, because again, if this was to be used for tighter, we want it to be linear and reproducible, and all those standard things we'd evaluate under ICH22. So again, Craig here looked at various different levels of antibody injection and saw really nice linearity over and up to 100 micrograms injected on column. He also looked at the performance at the higher and the lower levels to see how the actual mass spec performance was. And you can see again from the data on screen very nicely so we get beautiful spectra at both the higher and lower points, which again, upon deconvolution, gives equivalent data. The only thing with this is expected. As we go to lower and lower quantities, then we do see an ever so slight increase in the deviation of PPM mass accuracy. But everything, regardless of this, was still below our 25 PPM acceptable limit. So even though for very low levels, the system works really, really well and gives us very nice and usable data. The next thing which Craig did then was to evaluate applicability to different molecules containing an FC region. So in this case, he looked at a number of different antibodies of varying complexity, just based on other post-translation modifications, such as C-terminal lysine clipping or glycosylation. For example, cetuximab, which is known to have the additional glycosylation site in the FAB region. So again, you can see very nicely from the central panel, the increased complexity of the spectra with the increased complexity of the molecule. But regardless of this, due to the analysis under native-like conditions, we capture that increased spatial spectral resolution, which allows for efficient deconvolution and annotation of quite a number of PQAs in the associated deconvoluted spectrum. 
He also looked at an ADC mimic, in this case, a cysteine linked ADC mimic, where the utilization of native like conditions was important to maintain any particular non covalent interactions or to minimize stress in the molecule, which might cause the molecule to unwind or fall apart. So, again, this works very, very nicely. You can see the spectrum, very complicated in this case, due to both the presence of the uh, conjugated drug, but also the glycosylation present in the FC region. But again, we could deconvolute this and get usable data which allow for annotation on the back end. The last thing which we did as part of the study was to bring this to the process and see how it might actually behave, in this case in an outline format. So we ran a number of bioreactors using a standard show cell IgG1 producing process, collected the samples at different days, and you can see three of those days shown on the slide here. So the nice thing again with this, really what we're looking is the comparison of the colors between the graph, not across an individual graph. You'll see the condition used labeled on the x-axis below. But with this, we can track various different attributes again, in particular glycosylation and galactosylation in this case, which you can see from particularly the green and purple bars, how it changes in response to the process age and the process conditions as we go forward. So all in all, this coupling of protein A directly to MS to generate these native like MS spectra it gives us a lot of information in a very rapid method. And it's something which we're now exploring further to really kind of determine its full utility. The next thing which I want to talk to you about is the performance of the QXACTA Plus and the Orbitrop Explorers 240 MS for native LCMS based applications. And this case is work which was done by Sarah Carrillo and Florian Fusa within the group. We previously presented initial evaluations of the Orbitrop Explorers 240 MS for a variety of different biopharmaceutical applications. And these included things, for example, native LCMS, intact mass analysis, subunit analysis, and peptide mapping applications. But of all the things we did with the system, what really kind of blew us away was the performance of the system under native conditions for native LCMS applications. For example, things like size exclusion or pH gradient charge variance analysis coupled directly to the system. So when we had a bit more time, we then wanted to understand what's the actual relative bounds, particularly in sensitivity of the Orbitraph Explorers 240 versus the QXactive Plus. So you can see the experimental conditions that were performed on both systems, either for size exclusion or pH gradient charge variance analysis shown on the screen here at the moment. But let's have a look at the data. So from the Orbitraph Explorers, you can see here for some size exclusion data, various amounts uh, of antibodies which were injected onto the column under various different resolution settings. You can see the associated chromatograms on the left, the native MS spectrum in the center panel, and then an expansion of that on the right hand side. So we can look quite clearly here and see and pick settings which allow us to have obviously a sufficient number of points per peak if we want to have a look at any sort of quantitative applications. We can look and see how the spectra itself looks like and look at the sensitivity. And then again, match this across with the resolution value to make sure that we have that power to separate any near isobaric interference that might be present within that spectrum. We did the same experiment, obviously, as part of the comparison on the QXactive Plus. Again, you can see it here quite graphically as we increase the resolution settings we start to see that dissolution of the signal really just due to the longer transient times and that slight loss in sensitivity. But to kind of do this and to look at this head to head, we actually wanted to compare this in terms of single noise level. And that's what you can see here for again, one particular extracted charge state on the screen at present. Again, Orbitrop Explorers data on the left hand side in red and the QXactive Plus data on the right hand side in the blue color. The resolution settings used indicated on the left-hand panel. So quite nicely here, you can see the signal to noise levels determined from the actual experimental data. And as expected, and as we had observed previously, but now with an actual number on them to determine what they were, we can see that increase in signal to noise, which we get using the Orbitraph Explorers for native LCMS applications, in this case, size exclusion hyphenated directly to the instrument. We looked at this again under different conditions for example, now using different load on column. Color scheme is the same, so you can see how each instrument behaves at both a 50 microgram or a 25 nanogram on column load. So again, 
beautiful native MS spectra obtained, and then the expansion of an individual chart state over on the right hand side. And really then, as we go through the process of doing our deconvolution within Biopharma Finder, we can see really again, as expected, the associated PPM or delta mass accuracy on the right hand side. And as expected up here, because we have a higher signal intensity coming from all the traffic stores, we can actually maintain the uh, mass accuracy to a higher level than we had seen slightly before on the QX Active Plus. But again, there's not a massive difference between the two of them. It allows us to really kind of see what the benefit ultimately is. For some pH gradient charge variant workflows now, in this case here, we looked at Humira, and we previously characterized Humira before. It has quite a complex charge variant profile, resulting not only from the peak seen on screen with the different lysine variants, but also from another, a number of acidic variants of very low levels with different degrees of um, deamidation present on the molecule. What you see here for this zero T term, zero C term lysine variant is an expansion of data in the bubble whereby different amounts of Humira were injected on column. Again, Orbitropic Explorers 240 in red, QXACTIV Plus in blue. And you can see the associated signature noise determined for each of those injections indicated on the charge state expansion. The nice thing with this, for some of the initial experiments we have performed as part of the development of this methodology on QE+, we used 100 micrograms. But now on the Orbitraff Explorer 240, at a 10 times lower on-column sample load, we have a much higher signal to noise ratio. So again, a quantitative estimation of how far we can increase sensitivity on the Explorer 240. If we look now at the lower variant, in this case, the form which has the 2C term license present, even though overall the relative abundance of this is quite low. Again, when we look at the charge set expansion and look at the associated loadings, keeping the color scheme again, red for Explorers 240, blue for QXACTIV plus, we can see again, even for this low level of variance that's present, our signal to noise for low on-column loadings with the Explorers 240 is superior to what we had observed with QXACTIV plus. So it really does allow for quite a big bounce in sensitivity for native LCMS applications which we really like because it maintains and preserves the dynamic range of modifications that are present on these complex molecules. One final example we looked at was again using the Sigma ADC mimic. And for example, as you see on screen here, this is a stochastic cysteine linked ADC mimic where we have the different forms that are present between zero, two, four, six, and eight of this model uh, conjugated drug on the particular antibody itself. So one of the things which we must determine for these ADCs is the drug to antibody ratio or the DAR. And this can be done using things like hydrophobic interaction or indeed intact native mass analysis. And that's what we were interested in here. So when we perform this, you can see what the data looks like. Again, maintaining the color scheme as indicated on slide. And we get these beautiful spectra, beautiful spectra, complex, where we see the amount of information Again, because we have the conjugation of the drug to the antibody and also the glycans present in the FC region. But really what's of note here is when we look at the expansion in the gray box on the right hand side, on the QX active plus, we actually start to lose the information as we reduce the sample loading for the DAR0 and DAR8 form. I know this is quite hard to see, I appreciate it, it's quite small here. But when we look at the same data moving upwards from the information generated on the Orbitraffic Explorers 240, even though these forms are present to no levels. And as we reduce the on-column sample loading, we still have sufficient signal presence to allow for the efficiency convolution and the annotation of the drug to antibody ratio. Moving on, the third short story to talk about today is some rapid subunit analysis of MABs, which we've performed using online electrochemical reduction. And the data which you see now was work which was performed by Thomas Morgan within the group. So subunit analysis of MABs is a pretty standard workflow, and I'm sure you guys are all familiar with this. And it's traditionally performed using things like chemical reduction, so where we either have reducing agents such as DTT, denaturing agents such as guanidine. There's a bit of sample prep, a bit of time involved in this. It takes some time to, to have these reactions perform efficiently. 
Um, or we can combine this again with things like IDEF, IDEF protease digestion if we want to, instead of form our heavy chain light chain, form our FC over two, our FT and our light and our light chain. Again, very, very standard workflow, things which we're all pretty much familiar with. But in this case, what we wanted to look and see was, could we actually speed this up by getting rid of the sample prep altogether and performing the reduction step using electrochemistry online? And in this case, the device used was the Antic Scientific Rocket Seed Potentiostat. And the reason with this was, again, to see if we could do our sample preparation quickly, but also then if we could do this under non-genatrium conditions. Again, thinking back to some of the now complex molecular formats where we may want to have a look at label modifications, non-covalent diet interactions, or other things whereby sample preparation may just disrupt this and not give us the information that we need. So to perform this, the setup was as follows. We used a thermal scientific Vancouver's Duo UHPLC. We had the Antic Scientific Roxy Siege potential set cell in line. You'll see the plumbing of this uh, shortly. We used two MAPAC or P reverse phase columns, one as a trap and one as an analytical column. We hyphenated this either to our Q-Exacted Plus or to our Orbitraffic Explorers 240. And everything was performed, including the electrochemical aspect, under the control of Thermal Scientific Promedian 7.2 CDS system. In terms of the electrochemical cell itself, the nice thing with this is that it offers state-of-the-art simple-to-use electronics. And for the reduction purposes, effectively, this is a step wave, a very quick step wave. So when cell is off, we don't get reduction, but when we turn on the reduction potential, obviously we have the electrochemistry happening, which allows for the reduction of the disulfide bonds and effectively the splitting of the molecule into individual light chain and heavy chains. To set this up, we wanted to do this in line. So effectively this would allow us to use the electrochemical cell as I said for sample prep. And we did this basically using the unique capabilities of the Vanquish Duo with a single switching valve for effectively a, a bind and a loose, a uh, very standard uh, approach. So in this case here, we have the first pump from the dual system, providing the mobile phase, which was necessary to allow for the online reduction. We could turn the cell on, allow the reduction to happen, and then capture the reduced heavy chain and light chain on our trap column. Then when we're ready, we simply switch the column and use the second pump to provide the analytical mobile phases. Um, to elute from the trap, carry on to the analytical column, allow the separation to happen, and ultimately then allow for the high resolution mass spec detection. Quite simple and quite standard approaches. So, Thomas, as part of this, did a lot of the optimization of the electrochemical reduction step. And the nice thing, as you see on top here, with the cell off, we get our intact antibody. With the cell on, initially using water, we could see some reduction but we were getting a variety of different species present, most likely due to incomplete reduction of the intra-chain disulfide bonds, both on the heavy and the light chain itself. And you can see this again from the associated MS data shown on the right-hand part of the slide. So when we looked at the data, Thomas also did a model of the distribution of the masses and charge states. And we could see now, based on this and what the experimental data looked like, so we were somewhere in between from a fully reduced and a fully unreduced species. What we noticed then with this was because of the conditions really with 100% water, we were hitting a kinetic barrier. So using those particular conditions, we were getting some reduction, but unfortunately it wasn't possible to increase the uh, reduction further with the applied electropotential. So we wanted to investigate this and see if we could find a solution. And it was quite simple really as he worked through this, he saw simple things like increasing the temperature and the addition of a small amount of solvent allowed for relaxation of the tertiary structure for more efficient reduction. And as we go through these, you can see the different conditions as indicated on the chromatograms on the left hand side. We can go from incomplete reduction to complete reduction. We can also track this quite nicely based on the change in retention time on the map back RP column, because as we reduce into nature, obviously we expose more hydrophobic residues. And Again, using the associated MS data, we can see how the charge state change changes from where we have incomplete reduction to the more complete reduction. We see this very nicely move um, in the associated mass spectra. And when Thomas again did the isotopic modeling uh, based on charge states, again, now we can see 
uh, as we go from this intermediate species with incomplete reduction to the complete reduced species, very nicely that we have the confidence that the conditions used allowed for complete reduction in a very rapid time frame. The nice thing with this then was that we could combine this with IDS protease suggestion to allow us to get our standard FC over two light chain and FT separation. So the digestion was performed in solution offline, and then the sample was taken and injected directly onto the system setup as outlined previously through the Roxy, where we turned the cell on, used the reducing square wave to allow us to actually do the inter and interchain disulfide reduction. We capture the selectivity of separation on the map or P, and then we get the beautiful high resolution MS data, as indicated on the bottom of the slide here, indicating complete reduction. And when we do the deconvolution, very, very nice and high mass accuracy. So again, just a quick outline of what we can do in this regard, where we've incorporated this online reduction um, to minimize sample prep and sample handling. And we're still exploring this to see what else um, we might be able to do with this on both the intact subunit and indeed on the peptide level. Very quickly, the last short story I want to tell you about today is some of the work we've done with the peptide mapping of AAV-based gene therapy using automated digestion and high-resolution LCMS. And again, this work was performed in the lab by Felipe Guapo and Josh Smith. One of the key things with this is that AAV-based gene therapy is extremely complicated to work with due to the limit qu limited quantities of protein that's present despite the high capsid number or high viral genome count. So we hear these incredibly large numbers, but unfortunately it doesn't translate to protein, and we end up dealing with quite trace samples. Additionally, due to the sequence degeneracy across the viral capsid proteins, the annotation of the location of post-translational modifications is very, very complex. We've had the associated guidance from the regulators, as shown here, cut from the FTA, and they require for CMT aspects of gene therapy submissions, methods capable of characterization and identity testing, analysis of process-related impurities, and indeed analysis of product-related impurities, for example, the full to empty capsid ratios. And the nice thing with all these technologies is that LCMS really fits the bill. What we've looked at this so far is for sequence verification and PTM assessment as part of the identity testing and characterization workflows. And we've also performed the analysis of residual host cell proteins present on the affinity purified AAV, which again is a challenge based on sensitivity to address the process related impurities. And we'll show you briefly some of the data which has been generated so far. So a key challenge when we started to do peptide mapping workflows, and again, we're all familiar with how we do this for antibodies and recombinant proteins. But for AAV to achieve high sequence coverage, we have to actually look at a number of different enzymes. We wanted to use the Thermal Scientific Smart Digest Kits on the Kingfisher Duo, Duo Prime purification system based on the control which we get using the automation uh, capabilities of the Duo Prime. You'll see shown on slide here three overlay chromatograms and from the orange one with trypsin, we really didn't get much signal back. We got quite low sequence coverage for all the AAV proteins. We invested smart chymotrypsin as well. This was a little bit better, but not much. But really what we found was by using the smart pepsin magnetic kit option, again with the Kingfisher Dual Prime to really control the digestion, we could get really nice digestion of the capsids and indeed complete sequence coverage of the individual capsid proteins present. We overlaid this in terms of the individual uh, protein sequence, in this case shown on slide, it's the faster sequence for BP1. And this basically uses the colors, hopefully you can see the key up here on the right hand side, but it allows us to annotate the sequence coverage following analysis using Biopharma Finder, using the different proteases, and see where we have either complete or further we have gaps um, as we perform the peptide mapping workflow. You can again see conditions, experiment conditions, annotated over here on the right hand side of the slide. And from this, we've actually gone forward with the magnetic smart pepsin on Kingfisher Duo Prime for routine AAV based gene therapy peptide mapping applications. The last thing which we've done in this case was to look at the analysis of residual host cell proteins in AAV products, again, because it was a peptide centric technique, um, rather than looking at some of the more complex characterization aspects. We just kept going in that regard. So the 
what thing which we did here was to collect samples of AV which had been subjected to affinity purification using the thermal scientific porous capture select AAVX affinity resin. So we had sample which was collected obviously um, in the harvest cell culture fluid and then sample which was affinity purified there afterwards. And it was this affinity purified sample we wanted to look at to determine the levels of residual HCPs from the process present on those capsules. The workflow which we use, again, involves magnetic bead-based digestion on the Kingfisher Dual Prime. And following that, the samples were analyzed using the Orbitrap Explorers 240 with nano-reverse phase chromatography in the front end, and also on our Cubes Active Plus with NanoLT. Data was performed, or data analysis sorry, was performed using Proteome Discover 2.5. In terms of what we got back, you can see here in terms of both the uh, Venn diagrams and then also the bar graph, the information was quite interesting really. So for these essentially purified samples, if we search the data individually, so for example, either the Explorer 240 data on its own or the QExactive Plus data on its own, you can see there was a bit of disparity in the data. And again, not surprising as we've seen based on the increased sensitivity we've been able to achieve using Explorer 240. But it's not as if the Q Exactive wasn't doing a good job here. It's important to note that. If we look then over here on the, the center portion where we compare, compare and search the data together, in this case, using the workflow in Proteome Discover, you can see that the majority of these HCP contaminants were also found in the Q Exactive data as well. So it uses obviously the search output from the Explorer 240 to effectively retrain on the data set and then to go back and look for these in the associated files in the sequence. So this is quite nice. We have the confidence we weren't losing anything, but it comes down to the instrument sensitivity. And as you see over here on the bar graph, simply on the Explorer 240, we're identifying more peptides per protein, so more peptides per HCP present, and ultimately an increased number of HCPs. So to look forward into the data, we did simple things like a gene ontology um, annotation and visualization using Revigo, just to see what the actual information might look like. So you can see for both molecular function and biological process, again, our QE data up top versus the Explorer 240 data down bottom. Quite visually in this case, really just based on the number of spots or annotated GO terms, and indeed the coloring of those GO terms, simply based on the increased sensitivity on Explorer 240, we see more. And the really nice thing with this now, when we look at some of those identified GO terms, we start to actually pick up HCPs present on the viral capsids which were associated with the cellular processes of actual manufacture and expression of that particular viral capsid. So it gives us a nice indication in terms of the biological processes happening during the actual bioprocess itself and the repertoire then of proteins involved, which may be still associated with the capsid and pass through affinity purification and ultimately require a polishing step as part of the DSP. So that's going to be some information that I wanted to share with you as part of these four quick short stories based on their recent activities are, are uh, in bioprocessing. But as mentioned throughout, there's been quite a number of people involved. So to wrap up, to acknowledge everybody who's been involved as part of the team at NIWERT, again, to our collaborators at Antec Scientific for the work which we've done with the online electrochemistry, to our collaborators at AbbVie for the work we've done on the gene therapy applications, and to the huge number of collaborators as part of our interaction with Thermo Scientific, who not only are fantastic scientists, but fantastic people to work with also. Thank you so much for your attention and listening, and I'm happy now to answer any questions on any aspect of what you've seen that you may have. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jonathan, for that informative presentation. If you have any questions, please email Jonathan directly at jonathan.bones at n-i-b-r-t dot i-e. Before we go, we're going to go ahead and do our live audience. <clears throat> so our first question coming in is, what are some of the challenges that you have faced with AAV characterization? Thanks for the question, Susie. Um, the biggest challenge we faced really has been amount of material. Uh, it's been a whole new experience for us. I think when we've been working with proteins before, We've been used to having mig per mil type solutions. Um, with AAV, we hear all these huge numbers, but unfortunately they don't equate into protein amounts. So now we're dealing with microgram per mil solutions or lower. 
Um, so it brings a whole new challenge with regard to the need for sensitivity, the need for lower floor separations, et cetera. Um, but these things are, are surmountable. The technology solutions are there, thankfully. Um, it's just a matter of, I suppose, rethinking some of the things that we classically do. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and Jonathan, can you comment on load and elution solvents for protein AMS? Yeah, for sure. So the elution solvents that we use for all ammonium acetate based buffers, um, just at different pHs to keep everything volatile and mass spec friendly. Um, they worked really well. We did quite a bit of optimization. Um, that'll all be included in that, that publication, which is mentioned for that section of the talk. Um, the other thing with the loading was that we found the method was really sensitive, uh, probably slightly more so than the associated UV detection that we were using also. Um, so we could see, uh, you know, way less than a microgram on column. Um, again, all that information, uh, including the validation parameters which were undertaken, will be included in the associated publication. Thank you very much. And again, I want to thank our audience for these great questions. We have time for one more question. And any questions we don't get time for today, you can email directly to Jonathan. Our last question, Jonathan, how versatile is the electrochemical reduction method? It was really versatile, Susie. Um, we've used it a lot on intact protein and subunits as shown today. Um, it's work which we're actively uh, continuing at the moment to see what else we can do with this looking at a variety of different molecules, both antibodies and more complex formats. Um, it required a little bit of optimization, but once we got it up and running, it was really cool. It allows us to speed things up um, and generate some nice data. Jonathan, I want to thank you again for your important presentation and your research. And again, I want to thank our audience for joining us today. We hope you guys enjoy the rest of the event. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.